Well, uh, welcome everyone. My name's Angelo Di Grazia. I'm uh, a long-standing uh, uh, member of the association, probably as long as Len. So we're probably the old timers for the uh, for the association. And John, yes, John. I think I was number two on the register. John was number one, and I'm not quite sure what your number was in the early days. Anyway, besides all that, negative five. <laughs> negative five. I uh, I have the privilege of presenting Space News every month, and. Uh, uh, Often I have more slides than time, but I'll start off. And the first thing I'd like to talk about is uh, space policy, US, because that really dictates where, where space is really going. Uh, the first one is the administration uh, recently put up their $21 billion fiscal 2020. Uh, I think 2020 ends in September, somewhere there, uh, of the 2020 um, year. Uh, and uh, But there were some interesting components to that. Uh, this is the administration putting its bid to uh, Congress, and if you remember from the last past years, they always increase the budget. But this always starts off this way. But some of the important features, it defers work on Block 1B version of SLS um, with its larger exploration upper stage. Now, that's a pretty significant uh, change because it really makes the SLS nothing more than a uh, a big booster which a lot of other companies at the moment seem to have so it doesn't make it any uh, exceptionally any better it needs that exploration up the stage and all of a sudden they've put it in for an um, delayed it well they've deferred it for an indefinite period it would instead use commercial uh, rockets to launch elements of the lunar gateway it also would transfer the Europa Clipper another uh, flagship mission from the SLS to a commercial vehicle. And NASA is now working on a new realistic launch readiness date for the first SLS mission, which is now expected to slip beyond 2020. By the way, that's when Mr. Trump uh, finishes his term. And I'll come back to that because it has some significance in what's about to play out shortly. The proposal emphasizes commercial aspects of exploration um, including commercialization of lunar landers. So again, they're going to go this uh, public-private partnership thing that they've been using for a while to actually procure lunar landers. Uh, it's nearly 500 million below the 2019 budget. And again, NASA, as per the last four years, five years, have canceled some uh, events like WFIRST, astrophysics mission, and two Earth science missions. NASA, as you would expect, is now being criticised, um, again, for cutting back these, these areas, including the Education Office, as being short-sighted and deeply misguided. The Coalition of Deep Space Exploration, which is an industry group, uh, also warned that the budget relies too much on this public-private partnership. They don't see it as a really necessarily a great model, but everyone's got a, a barrier to push. Depends on who you talk to. The budget proposal, though, helps provide new momentum for the Lunar Gateway. Um, they've got about $821 million for the Gateway and uh, to build some of the upcoming modules for it. And interestingly enough, um, Jim Bridenstine, he says that there's a lot of support for it. Well, there's not many options. NASA has come up with this idea and uh, there's not many options. Some people say, why are you building this... Uh, uh, who was it that calls it a toll booth? Okay, the toll booth, when what you really should be doing, like the Chinese announced, just land on the moon. Go straight to the moon and land. Don't muck around with orbital platforms and space tugs and uh, machinations to get back to the moon. So the next meeting of the Sp National Space Council tomorrow, uh, NASA will uh, try to accelerate its human lunar exploration. And so uh, Scott Pace, who's the secretary of the council, uh, really said it needs a greater sense of urgency that will be expressed by the vice president tomorrow, uh, who chairs the council. Uh, Pace noted that both NASA's ongoing start study on commercial options um, to keep it on the 2020 launch schedule is obviously the driving force to this. They want something done before the president leaves office. And more importantly, if he gets re-elected for the second term, they want something substantial. Uh, there was a story that went round sometime that uh, um, 
Mike Pence basically asked NASA, uh, can you get to the moon and how much do you need? And NASA basically said, we can't do it. Doesn't matter how much money you throw at it, which was a bit of a disappointing. Again, Trump wants to make America great, and this is a great way to do it. International Space Station, um, again, there's a, a number of bills that are going around, but essentially, uh, if you remember last year, one got... Uh, uh, defeated in the House, but uh, again, they're trying to extend the use of the space station to 2030. Now, again, the space station, the reason what they want to get rid of it is because it takes funds, takes money. Okay, commercial crew program. And here we have the two competitors, Boeing and SpaceX. And I'll talk about Boeing first. It was April, they were going to fly the uncrewed uh, orbital flight test number one, um, was April, is now going to be probably August. Hasn't been confirmed yet. They have a pad abort test that was set for May, unlikely to be May. The Also, the crewed version of that mission was meant to be, um, I think it was August. It's probably, I heard, November, but it's likely the end of 2019. Have they removed the stall detection software? I uh, don't know. <laughs> I don't know what they've, they've done on this particular... But the, the problem is, and remember, Boeing got two point, uh, sorry, $4.2 billion to develop the CST-100 and SpaceX got $2.6 billion. So they got the lion's share of the money and they're the ones who are sort of, again, lagging behind. Not, they've not had a good week. Uh, more delays are expected. Uh, the uncrewed flight uh, will go out probably to November, maybe even uh, later. There's no specific reasons for it, and certainly Boeing are not talking. And there it is. Uh, I'm not going to play this video. But now we'll talk SpaceX. Well, as you know, on the 2nd of March, they flew their first uh, what they call DM-1, Demonstration Mission 1, which was a very successful mission. And they demonstrated that they could... Uh, actually get a manned spacecraft into space. However, it's not quite the full bottle. It needs more stuff in it, like the environmental uh, management systems and the actual systems to keep astronauts alive is not yet in the capsule, and there's a number of things they've got to get through. However, um, they got through it in March. In June, they're going to do a launch abort test. Um, Peter? But they docked with the ISS, and they into it so were they using the ISS's environmental system to yeah 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 so we're using their own. Wasn't I, I don't know how that worked but they couldn't you couldn't have taken a lift up to the space station in that capsule uh, July uh, they're likely at the moment it hasn't changed they're looking to launch their crude dragon um, and September they were looking at starting commercial uh, component of their contract, which is to take astronauts to the space station and save uh, the government $80 million per seat, which they currently are paying the Russians to get to the space station. Now, I suspect those timelines will, will drift, but um, it's more about certification. NASA has some really, really strict uh, rules. If it was up to Elon, he'd probably fly you tomorrow, but they won't. Uh, they have to get certification through NASA. Didn't NASA say that both competitors have still got a very long checklist before they'll be human rated? They do. Very long. I'm going to rush through some of these. This is what it looks like. This is the real real McCoy before it was put onto the launcher. Um, I'm not going to go into this, but suffice to say, they actually launched it on a Falcon 9 Block 5. And uh, you'll notice an interesting thing. Um, Notice pad 39A launch tower is now starting to get clad. Looks really cool, just like some of those uh, illustrations that they've been throwing around over the last few years. So that looks really good. And there it was going up. And of course, it landed on, uh, of course, I still love you, in the middle of the Atlantic. Of course. Of course. And there it is. It's quite a, it's quite a space uh, spacecraft. Peter and Michael from this... Table number one here, I've had the pleasure of actually being up against one of those. And there it is coming in. And I must tell you, the, the telecast that I saw was just brilliant. It was high definition and it was just gorgeous to watch it. Um, I often thought to myself, was this CGI or not? 
Uh, but there it is as it was coming into dock. And that was the first Dragon that actually docked itself because the uh, cargo versions of Dragon 1 was uh, uh, grabbed by the manipulator arm and then uh, pushed into the, uh, into the docking port. There it is. Canada, Canada arm, that's it. DM1. Again, um, it um, was very successful. Uh, everything went beautifully well. There was nothing to really go on about. But again, it's an incomplete spacecraft. Uh, it it uh, re-entered. Oh, and there's, uh, there's Riley. He's the... Ripley. Uh, Ripley, Riley. Ripley from <laughs> Aliens... Um, uh, uh, from the Alien movie. And uh, Ripley's a... Uh, monitored monitored mannequin uh, and they use that he'll be used actually for the she, she. he or she Ripley's a she okay I know that but he or she will be uh, in the pad abort uh, sorry the in flight abort coming up and then go to Mars later on <laughs> possibly and then uh, four parachutes open NASA uh, they weren't really confident in the three parachutes, so they told them to put another one on there. I must confess, I thought that was the shakiest part of the uh, the launch myself, because the parachutes kept sort of wobbling around and crossing over each other, and I thought, oh God, here we go. But it uh, it worked, and there's the ship that actually pulled it out of the water when it landed, and there it is. Um, I hope they know how to paint that up before its next flight. Its next flight will be the launch abort. Okay, so um, these are the two guys that are going to be launching on DM2 in July, August, maybe September. So they have the privilege of uh, flying. And, and they were at the, um, they actually watched the launch and then flew to uh, Los Angeles at the, to Hawthorne and watched all the operations with a very keen eye, no doubt, making sure that everyone looked like they knew what they were doing. But uh, great, great outcome. Now to a bit of SpaceX. Um, I thought I'd throw this in here, in here because I thought uh, love this story. This is an Israeli um, lander that was launched by SpaceX not so long ago, and it's slowly been manoeuvring its way into a position where it will get captured by the moon and will eventually land on the moon. And there it is. Bereshit. Uh, so it's going to land, there they are, it's not very big, but they're going to land there at, uh, in April, early April. So this will be, you know, this, the Chinese got there a little bit, a bit of time ago. These guys will start and then there's going to be a series of, you know, another moon invasion coming up over the next few years, which is great, great to see. The other SpaceX news is the Air Force has got a really keen eye on the next launch of SpaceX, which is a Falcon Heavy. Uh, so it's going to be carrying the ArabSat 6A communication satellite. Um, they, those boosters that they're going to recover, if you recall the first time they had two boosters land at Kennedy Space Center, they will be reused to carry the Air Force's STP-2 payload in June. Um, but again, uh, it helps the Air Force really get confidence in using this big vehicle and there it is so that'll be exciting we're going to see that in the next few weeks um, raptor engines they had uh, they tested one almost to uh, destruction uh, an amazing engine uh, we might do a talk on engines one day but i think it'll only be me and you dave that'll be interested in it but uh, uh, pretty amazing engine it's a methane liquid oxygen uh, it's a it's a closed cycle thing, so nothing everything gets used. They use all the the energy of the gases to to make this thing really efficient. Uh, but they almost uh, loaded it to destruction, and you can see you got uh, BE4, which is a Blue Origin engine, which is being built, and that's another amazing engine. But you got the Raptor, uh, which is going to be used by Elon in his. Uh, um, uh, Starship as well as his um, heavy lifter and there's the Merlin engine that fires uh, that drives the Falcon 9s that's the Raptor amazing engine 
So the engine actually arrived in Texas, southeast Texas, not so long ago. Only a few weeks ago, uh, they integrated it into what has become known as the hopper, Starship Hopper. The reason it's a hopper is because that's exactly what it's going to do. It's going to hop uh, gradually from a few inches off the ground to uh, up to five kilometres. Uh, it will do the low altitude testing. It's got one engine in it at the moment, uh, but apparently there's going to be another two put onto it. So it'll have three engines. So it'll simulate landing of what will become the Starship. And this is what it looked like a little bit, uh, a little bit ago. And it had dummy engines on the bottom. It had three at that stage. And then a big wind came along and knocked the nose cone off it. <laughs> so now there it is with the real engine in it. And now it looks like a little bit like R2-D2. And, and, that's, and that's what they're going to use to do their testing. They're not going to put a uh, nose cone on it because they don't need it. Uh, interestingly enough, this week, starting today, uh, they've got uh, flight clearance for this thing. So uh, as soon as we see the roads close, and we haven't heard that announcement yet, they'll start to... Uh, They've been testing this thing and uh, pressurising it, and you'll see gas go everywhere. Uh, but they haven't uh, um, ignited the engines or the engine yet. There it is. They moved it from its construction zone to its uh, launch zone, and there's a live web cam. So if you want to get onto the live web, you can keep your eye on it, and you might see a flame come out of it very shortly. And that's the launch pad area. And this is the construction area. Now there's a, a really nice takeaway in this. That's this thing. What's this thing? We thought it was going to be put on top of the hopper. Well, no. That is the, the actual Starship being manufactured. I don't believe it, but that's what they're telling me. Sorry? More tie downs this time. But they are building a Starship. Now the Starship is something, this is the craft that they're going to land on the moon, land on Mars, and it's going to have all that transpiration uh, heat, uh, cooling system and it's going to have the heat tiles on it. Uh, how they're going to build cockpits and things in this kind of environment is beyond me. But yes, this, there's a method to the madness. Go on. Uh, this is the orbital prototype and they will be manufacturing, according to Elon Musk, in Boca Chica, Brownsville and also in Florida. Yes. They're the two sites. By the way, all that uh, carbon fibre stuff that they had up in the Port of LA, they basically scrapped it. So there's probably a billion dollars worth of tooling and uh, product just thrown out the door. And they've cancelled their lease in Port of uh, LA. So they're going to go to metal, are they? They are going to stainless. Interesting. It's a stainless steel solution. And, it, and if you really look at it, it really makes sense. It's a brilliant Ah, no, nah. it, it, it has a, a lot of other benefits. This is what it's going to look like. Uh, you'll see the Saturn V and next to it you've got the Super Heavy at the bottom and you've got the uh, Starship on top and that's compared to a Falcon 9. Um, so he's building really a Starship prototype to go into orbit, test all the thermal properties etc. And there it is, that's before the uh, nose came off. I've only got a very short period of time, but I'll very quickly do the SLS. I'll run with that very quickly. This is the space launch system. This is the government rocket. It's probably cost them, oh, I'd guess, with Orion on top, $10 billion, maybe more. Um, it'll probably end up costing about $30 billion, maybe more. Not reusable. This all gets thrown into the sea. Uh, old technology, old 70s technology. It's, uh, my own personal opinion, it's job for the boys. Um, it was to hedge the bets against commercial space, I must admit, when it was announced in 2010, but a uh, couple of announcements re recently. At the beginning of the month, there were, NASA sort of said, oh, look, we're, gonna, we're not going to make the 2020 date, and, uh, but we wanna, we're looking at it, and we'll, we'll fly safely, so we're going to go at a good time. There was a report by the Office of Inspector General that said, you're not going to make the middle of 2020. That's only a year away, right? Um, you've got too many other issues. The driving critical path is the core stage. Uh, but NASA keeps saying that we're working on it, and there's the core stage. This is actually the core stage that they're going to be flying. Well, the bombshell followed. 
Bridenstine, uh, uh, when he was talking to the Senate, basically said the agency was considering flying the Orion spacecraft on commercial rockets instead of its own SLS. Uh, Bridenstein told the Senate committee that NASA was studying the feasibility of flying EM-1, uh, which will be the first launch of the S which was to be the first launch of the SLS, now on commercial rockets. Under the plan, two commercial rockets would launch, one with the uh, Orion service module and the other one with the um, basically the uh, stage, a booster stage that boosts it to the moon. And they would dock in, in, in orbit and go for the moon. Uh, under the plan, the two commercial rockets, there, there you have it. Bridenstein said a decision could ultimately be made in the next few weeks. So that's pretty amazing. Uh, with the goal of trying to fly by mid-2020. Uh, again, hidden code before Trump goes for election. The following day, though, Bridenstein clarified a little bit and backed off and basically said he they were still committed to the SLS. However, it's only a stopgap measure to get EM-1 going next year. They would inevitably use the space launch system for their program of getting back to the moon, etc., etc. Without the exploration upper stage, I don't know how they're going to do that, but that's another story. So he obviously got a few words from a few people. Uh, in Congress, like there's a bloke named Shelby, um, Senator Richard Shelby from Alabama. He's basically been supportive of the SLS for a long, long time. And, it, and the SLS is being built uh, around the country. 30 states are involved. And they're all using hardware from the shuttle era. And the reason is, is because they're all tooled up for it. And as I said, personal opinion, uh, it looks like job for the boys. Uh, it looks like votes for the boys. Votes for the boys as well. So the bottom line to this is the SLS has got a lot of support in the House. Uh, some people called it the Senate launch system rather than the space launch system. Uh, however, Bridenstein is no dummy and he's actually, in my opinion, he's done an amazingly well job since he's been there as a NASA administrator, he's trying to look at this and try to reinvigorate, uh, uh, you know, the uh, NASA and reduce its costs and get some objectives uh, worked out. As I said before... Does the story that you've told in the last three slides look like a person or organisation that knows what it's doing? I, all over the place. NASA? Yeah. I, on this... Look, there's too many... Too many fingers in the pie here. Since this is not do, like SpaceX. Since when do politics drive space flight? <laughs> I, I thought it was a rocket flight. <laughs> <laughs> Are you kidding me? <laughs> the famous line in The Right Stuff. What was it? No bucks, no buck rogers? That's what it's about. Okay. Uh, and there's some pictures there. But this is the uh, exploration the Orion mission profile. Well, right? The Orion is no Lockheed Martin. I don't know. That's Lockheed Martin. Boeing's building the uh, SLS. Right. That's why they're in hot water. Have they removed the stall detection software? <laughs> Was that, is that the problem? In space you can't um, The other thing is that uh, the government shutdown also delayed uh, an upcoming test. This is the actual uh, launch abort for the Orion that's going to come up. That'll be an interesting test and there's a sort of an a picture of it and uh, it'll be to test the ejection system uh, in a live launch. Um, that'll be amazing. That's quite an elaborate piece of uh, ejection technology there. It's not just y your father's, you know, 1969 Apollo ejection system. This thing's got real smarts in it. It moves a capsule in all sorts of ways. But they uh, did a board test with that a few years ago, didn't they? Just the capsule? They did, just the capsule straight off the ground as did uh, SpaceX and Boeing are about to do as well for their CST-100. And the last thing is they've been constantly testing the uh, amazing space shuttle engines. Trouble is they're going to use four of them on SLS. They all fall into the sea, never to be seen again, which is a real tragedy, especially when these things were designed for shuttle use, multiple use, uh, which they did very, very well, one of the most reliable engines ever. Um, I think that's probably enough. I've gone five minutes over. So, all right, Blue Origin, very quickly. Jeff Bezos. 
Uh, of course, you know, he's building uh, the New Glen rocket up on the top and has changed constantly. They don't have that small fairing at the top now. I think it's a complete, I think it's seven meters, seven meter diameter all the way up. And uh, so they've been studying with NASA a number of uh, initiatives, not to mention their moon initiatives, but uh, uh, how to use the upper stages to actually be used as space station components. Again, they did this years ago. If you remember the, uh, the tank, the shuttle, space shuttle tank, they looked at using that for space station components and it came to nothing. But maybe they're a bit more serious now. I don't know. Um, there's the new Glenn. And there it is in comparison to everything else. It is a big rocket and uses uh, some pretty good engines. Um, Blue Origin are also expanding. Uh, those that have been to the Kennedy Space Center, and I know you have, Len, and seen the big, uh, and, and Peter, and, and seen the big um, factory that they've got there, well, guess what? They've bought more land. They want more facilities there. Uh, so clearly, uh, things must be on the up. And there it is. Now, I can't, I can't picture this entirely, but uh, the visitor the center. Visitor center above it. The vi there's the visitor center. And I between, think between that drawing and the visitor center is where the existing blue. No, no, the other side of the road, just above the black, above the, that area there is where the existing blue here. Is. Yeah. So they bought the parcel just below. Yeah, that's why it's south. Yep, gotcha. Okay, and uh, that's the visitor center. Yep. You go across there as a causeway. Uh, you end up at the Kennedy Space Center right up, right here. Um, Blue Origin, they've been pushing their barrow for Blue Moon, Alanda. Uh, they've also recently acquired a ship. Uh, and they're now starting to fit it out so that they can land their New Glenn rocket in the middle of the Atlantic, very similar to SpaceX. I think they had a little bit of a fight over this one. Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos, uh, they love to compete against each other. It's kind of the modern day uh, Edison versus, um, who was it, uh, Tesla. I don't, well, well, he certainly didn't get away with it because, I mean, how can you patent something like that? Yeah, which one had the bigger divorce? <laughs> so he went down from $140 billion to, billion to well, I don't know. You're assuming there was a 50-50 split. California, it's 50-50 split. <laughs> All right. Um, the other one was obviously uh, looking at flying the New Shepard very shortly. I'm not going to go into great details there, but um, it looks like you can get yourself a trip on this thing, suborbital, but still be a wild ride. Um, it'll probably cost you in the order of two fifty to three hundred thousand uh, dollars, American dollars. He hasn't announced it yet, but uh, it looks like this might happen uh, early next year. Uh, paying ca customers, I suspect it might even be sooner than Virgin. I'm not quite sure. But this is a real spaceship. This will go up as a rocket. Uh, the capsule will uh, will detach at the apogee at the top and you will come down on parachutes. Fantastic. And the booster, of course, lands. That's it. Oh, last thing. Sierra Nevada, Dream Chaser, has passed the latest milestone. It's now going to go to um, uh, full design and construction. They expect to launch in 2021, which again is only you know, a year or two years, two years away. Pretty cool. There it is. That's what it's going to look like. It's not the passenger version that is not being developed. It's the cargo version. That's it. Thank you. <clears throat> Brilliant. Thank you. As usual, we're running a bit behind time. So we'll get Andrew Rennie up to with his Plan two in space science segment. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, where's it gone? Uh, concerning the Wait. Wait. Yeah, no, I'm just doing an informal. Concerning the Lunar Gateway, the Australian Space Agency had a display at the Avalon Air Show and it was full of moon stuff and all that sort of thing. And I said to the guy, I thought you guys weren't, go weren't supposed to be doing moon stuff and so on like that. You're supposed to be boosting Australian industry. And he said, yeah, we are. He says, uh, we're trying to get them involved in the Lunar Gateway. 
and he wouldn't elaborate on exactly what the agreements they're negotiating are, but it might be just making the dish mops that's going to be used by the astronauts, but uh, they're working on something for the Lunar Gateway. All right. Uh, that's my one of my last slides. So, it was the first one. The first one? Oh, okay. Um, I was going to start out with um, the summary of the what's going to happen over the next few years, but let's just quickly go through these then. The um, that's the mission that. Angelo mentioned the Israeli one, and this shows the orbit and so on that it's uh, going to do. And I, I haven't updated the date of capture that they plan to do that with. Where is it at at the moment? Sir? Where is it at? It's in the 400k or the 400k, but it hasn't been captured yet. Uh, yeah, my understanding is it's still in Earth orbit. It hasn't gone into the into the larger orbit yet. Okay, um, so I advance that by pressing that key, yep, right. Chang'e 4, these are some lunar reconnaissance orbit of uh, photographs and the dates you can read off there showing the movement of the U-22 uh, rover away from the lander which is here. And um, it's night time there at the moment but it will soon be sunrise and hopefully it's going to move again. This uh, map shows the movement uh, during the first two uh, lunar days. It's conference season at the moment over in America, autumn there, or what they call fall, because the leaves fall off the trees presumably. And the Lunar and Planetary Institute has had its conference just a few days ago and Harrison Smith was one of the keynote speakers and he showed uh, this photograph which has been renewed in a way that's never been shown before. He said that this shows the colours as he saw them on the moon. Now the ones you've seen of the orange soil so-called uh, have not had the true colours. So, uh, as of a couple of days ago, this is the, late, the best view we've had. Now, he then went on to explain a few things about what had happened uh, during the photograph and the sampling there. And they identified these uh, units on the moon. And, uh, oh, okay. The, um, the video thing there's there because I, these are screen grabs of the press conference uh, telecast that I made um, w while he was talking. So there are those units and these are the sample, the places they took the samples from in order to do that sampling and from that they've got a, a stratigraphy and an age timeline of what's happened and he said that this site has been hit at least three times and overturned and they can identify the in in millions of years. So Shorty Crater they reckon it's about three million years old and the soils, I'll call it soil, the regolith has been exposed to the solar wind uh, for various periods of time and he's still working on trying to do that. Remember he's not in, uh, in the Senate anymore, he's back as being a scientist. So uh, he, he gave that, that timeline. He then finished, he then went on to discuss the core samples and the sampling core they've done. And he explained what, and I've never heard this explanation before, he explained why they had so much trouble getting the core samples done. Apparently the lunar soil, the regolith, won't compact. Now if you try and do a core into the earth, the soil compacts as the, as the uh, coarse coring uh, tube goes down. The lunar regolith won't do that. It just sits there 
and won't compress, and therefore they couldn't get the drill in, uh, the core in. However, as a result of what they did get down, they've done some sampling of the nitrogen-15 isotope that's come from the solar wind, and he's identified a level at which this suddenly changed. And he asserts that this happened because the sun changed about 500 million years ago, and the solar wind made a dramatic change. And he links that to the Cambrian explosion and the diversification of the life on Earth about 540 million years ago. And he says a thing. Now, <coughs> other people got up and said, uh, yeah, we don't quite believe you, but that's his argument that he's working towards. So there is a link there between the nitrogen 15 and the lunar soils and the stratigraphy. So watch that space and see what happens as we go on forward in the future. Now we come to Bennu, uh, which is a small asteroid and a few hundred meters across. And uh, this is a rotation movie taken by the OSIRIS-REx spacecraft. Again, we've got problems just like we had with Hayabusa. Ah, it's all rocky. There's not many places where there's uh, soil. And both of the two missions, uh, the Hayabusa mission, and the um, OSIRIS-REx mission uh, rely on a, a particular method of sampling and it's going to be difficult and tricky. Okay. By the way, see that big lump of rock down the bottom? There? The one that's just disappearing around there? Uh, yeah, look online and you'll find there's a lot of nutters there saying it's an artificial structure and the aliens have been there and left it there and all that sort of stuff. So. Uh, the aliens have been to everything in the solar system and uh, left things for us to ponder about. Uh, here's a close-up view of the um, of the surface of Bennu. Again, it looks very much like the Ryugu close-ups. Very rocky, not much um, sandy regolith at all. So it's going to make something rather difficult. And another close-up view of the. Um, one of the possible landing sites or touchdown sites, it's not going to land, it's going to boom, and go away. All right. Sampling, uh, so spectroscopic measurements have shown that it's uh, got a lot of clay on it. So there's been uh, some water, or possibly still is water, on this uh, asteroid. And uh, the spectro shows there, I won't go into the details of what it shows. But here's an interesting finding. Those specks here are not stars. They, that is material coming off the asteroid. <coughs> and when I saw that, I thought, oh, okay, yeah, bang, so, yeah it's just, they happened to photograph it just when uh, it's been hit by another uh, meteorite or something and it's spluttered material off. Then I read the caption and the details, and I uh, listened to the press conference, and no, this is just one of many events that they photographed. This thing is sputtering material out into space, and they don't know why. There's no real explanation yet, but some, something is sputtering it off. It's not because it's being hit by meteorites. So those little things here are actually um, material coming off it. Yeah, it's got a very weak gravity, and if you were on it, you could just jump off it, no trouble. But it's it's not stuff just floating away, okay? For for stuff to float off it, that asteroid would need to spin quite a few times faster than it is at the moment. By the way, it is speeding up by the Yarkovsky effect, which is um, the way the sunlight shines on it, and it will double its spin rate in several. I think several hundred million years, if I remember correctly from memory. So it's not it's not spinning up so fast. It's going to fly off stuff. So this is not flying off because of uh, you know centripetal acceleration or whatever. Okay, um, th these are measurements of the um, material floating away from the um, asteroid. 
a science rex has changed from navigating with the stars to navigating to points on the asteroid. So on the left you have a previous thing as it approached, it was finding its position and also the uh, position of the Hyperiogu in relation to the stars in the background. So those uh, rectangles there are where the stars are, those are the mapping stars and it's figured out where it was. Now that it's in orbit and it's had time to map it, it is now using identifying features on the asteroid for its navigation. So it's now navigating in the asteroidal space as a reference frame. Uh, there's a, a potential touchdown point for uh, Osiris Rex and uh, there is a few areas like you see the small area there where uh, it's possible uh, they could get some soil samples. And another picture there's a 10 meter scale at the bottom there to give you some idea. So there are a few clear spots but they're going to have to obviously very precisely navigate to get down there. Meanwhile, we go to um, Raigu, and the t they've already made one sampling touchdown, and they're now looking. Uh, they did another close approach to find a second touchdown point, and they are keeping that in reserve, so they've approached it and come back. Yesterday, they did another sampling approach down to 170 odd meters I think it was and this area SO1 is where they're considering dropping the bomb onto it to make a crater and explode the crater away so that SO1 is where they're considering doing that but that won't be uh, for quite a few weeks yet. Now uh, as I said it's conference time and at the Lunar and Planetary Institute uh, I was interested to watch uh, this presentation and I've got the uh, slides from it and so what happened at New, at New Horizons uh, we know the trajectory already and the flyby uh, was done in that way and some information there about Ultima Thule 35 kilometers long and it's a contact binary obviously uh, it wasn't formed like that, it, it, they came together. And some terminology, they're calling the big part Ultima and the small part Thule. And the neck region is, uh, in explanation, I think it's because of grinding and so on, that's caused that uh, light coloured deposit there. We've got bright spots, the origin of which is not yet known. There is a, uh, some curvilinear features or lines on it. And um, they don't know what's causing the bright and the dark zones yet. They're sort of working on that. By the way, only 5% of the flyby data is down to Earth as of a few days ago. So they've still got 95% of the data still to come down. Uh, a shape model. Well, it turns out that it's not two round things. It's um, more like the one on the on the right there, and I've got a video to show if I get time to it, see it later, which shows it rotating. And there are some other objects in the solar system which have not quite the same shape. It's, it's, it's quite, no, nothing like this has ever been seen before. Uh, now, colour. Carly uh, showed the resolution as seen before the flyby, and then she updated it with a better resolution. And notice the two objects are pretty much the same colour. And that suggests that they've had an, uh, uh, that, that they formed in a similar area, that they didn't come from vastly different areas with different chemistry and so on. And combining it with the main imager, we get the combined picture, which shows a bit more detail uh, from the uh, color imager. There's not much variation in the color over the object. And uh, you can see there's a, on the left hand side there, there's a, a, a range of reds and so on. The, um, the neck area is particularly uh, bluer than the, the main part, which is red. By the way, it's, it's much redder than anything that you see on uh, Pluto, or Charon for that matter. And here's a composition map showing 
comparing it to other objects in the solar system and uh, it's definitely a class of its own. Now, uh, their surface composition, Sylvia showed uh, th these images and from that they're able to get uh, spectral uh, information And uh, from that, they're able to identify a number of things, including uh, methanol, water, and some tholins. So her conclusion is that there is evidence there for methanol, water, ice, and organics on Ultima Thule. The um, Kirby Runyon showed uh, this interesting thing. Now, from this, I would say that, yeah, you know, when you look at that over there, you can see the lumps. You know, that lump, that lump, and so on. It looks like it's been accreted from lumps. A bit like when you and children, you know, put plasticine together. And the map, that's been mapped out, and so you can see the different geological structures. So I would say, and uh, this, and um, the scientist uh, whose name is uh, Kirby, um, was of pretty much the same opinion that these this shows the struct, the, the materials from which the original uh, asteroid was um, formed. There's evidence of pit craters, but the origin of most of the craters is not known, that, whether it's impact or whether it's um, pit craters or something else. They have named the big one over here, uh, Maryland, and it uh, compares with Stickney on the moon Phobos of Mars. There are some mild hills, not very high, but um, still substantial, like Mount Dandenong, one dandy high, okay. And um, there's evidence of shearing around the neck there. Now, how did it come to form? Well, the two axes of the two parts are co-aligned. Now, if they had just come whamming and crashed in, that would be extremely unlikely that the axes would be aligned. So they're giving evidence that this thing actually had quite a long time circling around each other and the axes aligned gravitationally and then they gently touched. So that's uh, evidence of that. Comparing with other objects in the solar system, uh, Hyperion is pretty much, you know, flat like a hamburger, and uh, Atlas, of course, has got this, uh, you know, middle-aged waist around it. So, here's the picture of how it would have formed. These objects going off and seeing, in order to get them to sink, they've got to lose angular momentum, they've got to lose energy, and... To do that, they've got to fly stuff off. The question is, did they fly right away and be lost forever, or are they still in orbit? But quite a way out. Now, on the approach, they didn't see anything, but Alan Stern said that they are, you know, 95% of the data down, they are looking through that data to see if there's any moons further out. Still, uh, still uh, gravitationally bound, but still there. He says he doesn't know whether they're there or not, but they're, they're looking, even though the chances are fairly small. All right. Uh, they showed a movie of how that uh, th the two might, objects might have come together. And uh, there's some conclusions. All right. Now... That, okay, that's supposed to be a very high resolution picture of, uh, I just think sometimes these things take a while to load. There we go, it was just loading, yes, <laughs> just while I didn't panic. Uh, and I can enlarge that up. Now that's just when you thought it was safe to come to a space association meeting and not hear the word opportunity 
and Mars Exploration Rover mentioned ever again. This is one of the last pictures from Opportunity. We're doing a panorama shortly before it broke down. It got these, these pictures back. Uh, yeah, it broke down before it could finish this part of the panorama off. The last things it took were a few pictures of the sun. I'm not going to show them here now. They're just little dots in the sky. Through the dust storm. And uh, then it died. So I won't enlarge that up. I haven't got time. So let's uh, move on. So that, you can find that on the Jet Propulsion Laboratory website. And um, if you want the full resolution one, it's about 60 megabytes, which is what I'm showing you here now. That's why it took so long to load. ExoMars, they have named the um, rover. Uh, of course, Rosalind Franklin, uh, they did that uh, end of last year, I think it was, or earlier this year. And just a few days ago, the Russians announced that the name of the lander is going to be Kazachuk, because that's being made by the Russians, and is has just arrived in Europe for testing. So we've now got Rosalind Franklin and Kazachuk, which, by the way, is um, means for little Cossack. Does everyone know who Rosalind Franklin was? Uh, yeah, I did explain that last, uh, I think, last month or the month before. It's she was the one who was doing work on X-ray crystallography. She was the one who had the images that showed the diffraction pattern, that showed that DNA, the deoxyribonucleic acid, is a spiral shape. And she um, showed these pictures to two guys that came to her, visiting her one day. These guys are called Watson and Crick. And they sort of said, oh, okay. And they went back to, I think it's Cambridge. Yeah, other documents mysteriously changed hands as well, unbeknownst to her. Then their careers diverged. They won a Nobel Prize and she died. I'm just going to get to that. Right, anyway, so she's, uh, yeah, one of the, one of one of the saddest changes. things is that yeah. she, she didn't get the Nobel Prize. Well, she have. And she wasn't even mentioned when the other two got it. Right, and that's, uh, you know, you could almost cry over that. She basically found the helix structure, they took it, she died, and they won the Nobel Prize. Yep. Yeah. And you can't, you can't get the Nobel Prize posthumously anyway, so... But, you know, they didn't even acknowledge that at the time. Okay, uh, Juno is taking... Uh, you know, it's not supposed to have a camera on it, but that's the thing everyone notices. And uh, it's returning spectacular stuff like this one, which was published just a couple of days ago. Uh, the European uh, Sentinel satellites photographed the Earth, and this is a nice one from a few days ago uh, of, uh, you guessed it, where? And uh, for those of you who are geographically challenged, Christchurch is just there. Over here is the Mahe Peninsula, where this morning they tried to launch the Electron rocket with a defence, United States Defence Department satellite, uh, but they had a problem with the camera, uh, one of the video cameras, low voltage, and they said, OK, we don't know why, it's not going to affect the, the rocket launch, but we're cancelling anyway, and so, OK, I had other things to do the rest of the day. Now, this is the... Um, picture of these alignments. It's a little, oh. Here we go. So don't show videos. Right. And, uh, okay, so these are the two parts of Alta and Thule. All right. Now, try the next one. Oh, yes. The sound on this, I hope. Let's try. Uh, I lost the play. Oh, there it is. Okay. This is coming towards Ultima Tula. We explore because we are human. But we want to. 
Music was, of course, by astrophysicist and uh, New Horizons team member, Dr. Brian May. Okay, now, this one, and this one. Now, this is the touchdown of Hayabusa 2 on Ryugu. Now, don't worry, something is happening. So we've hovered, and now we're coming to the touchdown. And... Touch. And we're backing away now. And look at all the debris and stuff. Because what it did at that touchdown is fire a projectile, a bullet, into the surface it smashed the rocks and things and hopefully some of it's been collected by the sampling horn. Now what you see here is this is the sampling horn. I'm going to show this again in a few moments and have a look at that spot there. Keep your eye on that spot there. But now we're backing away having collected the sample. Right. Now, the camera that took this was crowdsourced. JAXA, the Japanese space agency, didn't have enough money for a camera to put on this thing, so it had to ask the public for money. <laughs> All right. Let's, uh, let's wind this back a little bit now. And so on my computer at home, I can use the scroll bar to get to the exact spot I want. Ah, now, here we are just a few moments before touchdown. Now, see that spot there? How it disappears? Just there? Okay. Let's go back a little bit there. Now, this is... Oh, sorry, I'm distracted. Okay, this is before touchdown. And what's happening here is there's a reflector on the sampling horn and there's a, a laser shining on it and that we can see the reflection of it in the camera but that laser the reflection of that goes into a sensor and when it touches down the sampling horn is spring-loaded and it's compressed which means the laser doesn't reflect into the sensor it stops going into the sensor and when the light going into, stops going into the sensor, the electronics on board says, ah, we've touched down. Fire the bullet. Boom. Soil comes up and collects it. And let's fire the thrusters on the spacecraft and get the hell out of here. So that's the little simple sensor that says touchdown. So I, don't, I did point out to you... Um, some months ago, that, that that would be what you'd see. All right. Uh, here's the, uh, the sampling site, and that little white spot you see there is one of the, the target markers. What they did, did earlier was approach the thing, drop a target marker down, and said, OK, we're going to fly referencing that. And so there's the target marker. There's the actual touchdown point there, and this is the target area there. So uh, they were using this as a reference point to, to approach. Now, uh, small bodies fleet, okay, that's what's around the solar system flying there. And, yeah, all right. Now, I have run out of time to show you the main feature of the presentation because we started at the back end of it. Uh, well, next month. It was uh, it's part two of my summary of what's happening in the, uh, in the solar system. So in planetary exploration and exosolar work and astrophysics work. So um, last month I did the 
what's already flying, what, you know, recently finished and, and currently flying. And tonight was going to be the missions that are about to launch or are under construction. So next month, because 29 seconds, 28 seconds to go. <laughs> All right, thank you, Andrew. I'm going to give Andrew a clap. That was great. Just so now it's coming up to 10 o'clock and we've come to the end of our meeting. So um, thank you for coming out tonight and finding us here. It's a new venue for us. What do we all think of this venue? It's pretty comfortable? Yeah, feels good? Yeah, I thought it was great. Um, so if you're not really on our email database or list here, come up and put your name and your email address and phone number there. We'll Sending you a subscription to Reader's Digest. No. Um, so the next one's about Springstreet? To be advised. We do have a booking there, um, but we may see what we can do to stay here. I don't know. We're going to have a chat to them about it. I'll have to do a bit of negotiation. But uh, if anyone's got any strong objections or positive feedback, we'd love to hear either an email or a phone call or something like that. Um, and uh, we'll uh, we'll have some more to say about that during the during the time between now and then. Um, next month we're doing our feature on the Australian component of the Apollo program, so that should be pretty fascinating. I'll we'll start working on that tomorrow morning. Um, and I'd like to say thank you to Ashley once again for all the uh, work on the IT side and his colleague, which I don't recall his name, uh, the on Support Network, and our speakers Len, Angelo, and. Uh, Andrew, of course. Um, and uh, that's about it. Um, stay around for a little while, if you like. I'm not sure if they're going to kick us out yet. But uh, thanks, everyone, and we'll see you next month. 22nd of April.